Uh, I'm Elizabeth Pena. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts and Religion here at the GTU, and I'm really delighted to be here today to um, be with you today to hear the presentations in this session, uh, Art, Literature, Praxis, and Ecology. We have um, all great speakers from the GTU, homegrown, so we're really excited to get started here today. Our first speaker will be Devin Zuber who is um, a professor at the Center for Student and Boarding Studies and the Graduate Theological Union. His talk is entitled, Sustainable Landscapes, Religion, and the Law in Native American Image Texts. Thank you very much. So just to give a little bit of a sense of my own disciplinary context and location, I do a lot of work in eco-criticism, <laughs> ecological literary criticism, so some of what I have to present today comes from that particular approach to reading literature and aesthetics through the lens of a concern with environmental ethics and the like. And when uh, this conference began as an idea and came forward, I, I really began with sort of just a basic question as an eco-critic. If sustainability has its roots in the growing scientization of environmental studies on the one hand, and the economic development policy that follows the landmark 1987 Brundtland Report on our common future on the other, what do the arts or aesthetic experience have to offer a field seemingly delineated by the parameters of purely economic and developmental transaction? To put it another way, what kind of connection, if any, do novels, poems, or paintings have to do with the flourishing that has been so central for current stability, sustainability paradigms? And just, we've heard that word a lot in Rita's open remarks, flourishing. My paper argues that the realm of the aesthetic, the work of the imagination, or imaginaries as a collective social practice, in Charles Taylor's sense of the term, is critically constitutive to sustainability. Not only can the aesthetic model alternative futures and deviant breaks from our status quo relationships with the environment, it cracks open our capacity to greater affect. The embodied experiences of wonder, even of love, and our corresponding attachments towards the other than human things and beings around us. A dimension of our inner experience of the phenomenal world that standard economic and development policy is often incapable of accounting for. To illustrate my contention more succinctly, I examine two canonical texts that have been central for the so-called Native American Renaissance, fomented by the energies of AIM, the American Indian Movement. Both Leslie Marmon Silko's Ceremony from 1977 and N. Scott Momaday's Way to Rainy Mountain stage relationships to particular landscapes that lie at the intersection of competing legal claims. Mountain sites entangled in private property disputes uranium mineral extraction, and Native American cosmologies. At key points in these two texts, the authors incorporate hand-drawn images into their prose, causing them to prospectively function as examples of what W.J.T. Mitchell and others have called an image text. These images tied to particular locales, Mount Taylor in Arizona in Silco's novel, and the so-called Devil's Tower in Momoday's memoir, can only anticipate the ways that these landscapes became sites of legal contestation for Native American tribes in the later 1990s, long after they were published, who pushed against a normative development, secular legal regime, that treated these mountains as more or less blank spaces for economic or recreational development. The images thus model a kind of cosmological cartography, a re-territorialization in the Deleuzian sense, that intercedes in contestations over what and how land and place was to be developed, or not, and by whom. The unsettling wordlessness of these indigenous image texts, the beauty of how both authors situate the images at key moments of plot in their prose, models the effective power of the aesthetic to adumbrate a kind of sustainability that the language of economics and development simply cannot say. This all comes from a longer, bigger research project I've been working on for several years that examines how Native American image texts offer one way of organizing indigenous aesthetics in relationship to the law. Had I not come to the GTU and stayed in the German system, this would have been my habilitation, or second dissertation. I'm interested in how these image texts uh, is one way to organize Native American uh, uh, 
literature, but also painting, in its relationship to what we might call the vagaries of landscape the Western iconographic tradition of embedding and framing Native Americans within a natural environment that is oversaturated with nationalist fantasies and their narratives. The sublime beauty of mountain landscape paintings such as Albert Bierstadt's iconic Landers Peak, Rocky Mountains pictured here, are inevitably part of the visual machinery of a developing environmental movement in the 19th century. This is perhaps clearest it, when we trace the cultural work affected by the paintings and photographs of the mountains in Yellowstone and Yosemite that are critical to the establishment of the first conservation and preservation movements, their popularity, um, and the establishment of the national park system. And yet, these sublime images are inextricably enmeshed in the erasure and displacement of native peoples. Part of the problem of the trouble with wilderness to paraphrase William Cronin, the environmental historian's seminal critique of the wilderness ideology that has continued to underwrite modern environmental policy, which is so often premised on this notion of an Edenic absence of the human in pristine, untouched nature, which quickly reifies nature and culture uh, binaries and dialectics. Back to Silco and Momade. Um, these texts were fomented by the richly created energies of the American Indian movement in the 1970s. In my larger project, I also discuss um, Momade but Forte, because I only had 15 minutes, I'm going to focus exclusively on the image text in Silco's ceremony from 1977, which is to your left. Um, if you've read those uh, pieces of Native American literature, although they're quite different in terms of their literary techniques, both of these turns towards sacred mountains uh, are vitally important spaces for the Kiowa in the Wada Rainy Mountain and the Laguna Pueblo in Silco Ceremony. Places that have been severely damaged and in some cases desecrated by unsustainable economic activities. These respective image texts, this is my argument, could be said to re-territorialize particular mountain places back into sacred cosmologies disrupting the secular claims of Western legal regimes that treated the mountains proprietarily as property, open to the speculative development of capital. As such, these images, as we will see, can only anticipate later legal battles around the mountains that became enabled by the enfranchisement of indigenous cultural rights in the 1990s. So let's now sediment this in a particular discussion of Silco's ceremony. And as Anyone in this room besides my students who I'm forced to read this in my class read, of course, Cynthia has. Awesome book. Great, okay, fantastic. So you can keep pace with me. Without going into all the details of plot, it's a very beautiful, um, constructed, beautifully constructed plot. Uh, it focuses on a shell-shocked veteran of World War II named Teo, who returns from the trauma of the Pacific Theater to his ancestral Pueblo homeland and embarks on a journey to recover his uncle's cattle that also becomes an act of spiritual recovery and healing. As Teo crosses over the property lines of barbed wire fences that have closed off the swaths of the holy mountain, known as Mount Taylor in English, looking for his family's missing cattle, the narrative is intersected and crisscrossed by poetic sections that recounts a religious Pueblo story, I won't call it a myth, about the son attempting to recover his kidnapped children, the rain clouds, from the evil gambler, Huapata, who has taken them away. The son ultimately sees through the evil gambler's deceptive tricks and is able to free his children, the rain clouds, but only after cutting out the gambler's eyes while he is feigning death, lying on the floor. The son then throws the gambler's eyes into the sky, where they become a very special set of stars that appear on the autumn horizon, annual harbingers for the Laguna and other Pueblo of the return of the rain over the slopes of uh, Mount Taylor, which is known to the Laguna as Sabina. And then slightly later in the text, these two narrative modalities converge. Teo looks up at the night sky and recognizes in the pattern of constellations the stars of the gambler's eyes, which he has been told to look for by an old <coughs> medicine man. In a single moment of unifying these two discursive narrative threads together, Silco interrupts the written flow of words with a single full-page image of the stars above Mount Taylor that Teo is ostensibly looking at and re-territorializing. 
And I always like asking my students, how do you read or see this image in the middle of this novel? How much time do you spend with it? How do you account for the presence of this image in the text? And as you can tell, it's, it's very deliberately not a photograph. It's been by hand. You can see the, the brushwork in it. The highlighting and underlining is not Silco. That's my own annotations in my copy. <laughs> In context of war and its traumas that are deliberately invoked by the novel, this central image text and ceremony might be read as a kind of visual repost to a well-known 19th century landscape painting by Frederick Edwin Church, a painter famous for his bombastic depictions of frontier wilderness in North and South America. Painted in response to the Confederate attack on Fort Sumter, the first battle of the American Civil War, Church's Our Banner in the Sky, 1861, concretizes the stars and stripes of the American flag transposing its national contours onto an evening sunset in the wilderness so that the twilight clouds and glimmering stars become an overt symbol of patriotic northern nationalism, a kind of divine endorsement of the ongoing war effort. Inextricable from a background of pro-union fervent patriotism, this image nevertheless distilled a broader cultural assumption about America as nature's nation a manifest destiny that was inscribed into the landscape itself. Within three months of this original oil painting appearing in New York, a chromolithograph was produced that became enormously popular, and the image of the stars in the landscape forming an American flag has become iconic, transcending its original 1861 locus, and today you can find it as patriotic kitsch <laughs> with pillows and tote bags, um, bed shirts, t-shirts, go on and on. This is not to suggest that Silco had Church's specific painting of stars in mind when she created her hand-drawn image for ceremony. Rather, Church's painting could be said to typify a broader cultural homology between landscape and nationhood that Silco's image text of the stars above Mount Taylor effectively disrupt. Her homemade stars rest the constellations out of any potential Americanness, out of the given nature's nation that tended to accompany the landscape genre, and re-territorializes them within a thoroughly native cosmology and local Pueblo narrative cycle. In this regard, Silco's image text functions as a proleptic device, anticipating how the intangible cultural heritage of Pueblo religious practice factored in future lawsuits and battles over the designation of Mount Taylor as traditional cultural property for an alliance of five Native American tribal groups, including Silco's own Laguna. Her stars are an insistent reminder of a different sacred claim on the land and the stories it engenders, one that her novel directly juxtaposes to the privatization and divisions of land on the slopes of the mountain that are trespassed by Teo. And for those who've read the novel with devastating consequences, it's the most dramatic point where he is assaulted and um, is in danger of dying by white ranchers who knock him out. When Silco wrote her novel, and here's a, another image of Mount Taylor, centuries of patchwork private land ownership, colonial grants dating back to the Spanish, and federal and state mining and mineral rights had all resulted in the sacred mountain being heavily utilized for forestry, cattle ranching, and most egregiously, uranium extraction. Starting in the 1990s, a groundswell of Native activism led to a push for the mountain to receive a federal designation as traditional cultural property a new legal status created by the 1992 amendment to the original National Historic Preservation Act, the NHPA, which Elizabeth Pena can tell us a lot about, of 1966. As such a designation would severely curtail the commercial uses of the mountain, particularly the uranium mining, which is a central part of the plot of the ceremony, a long and protracted legal struggle unfolded across in New Mexico state and federal courts. In 2009, so this is recent history, a state commission finally decided in favor of the tribal coalitions deeming the mountain permanent cultural property, a ruling that was overturned on appeal two years later by the 5th Judicial District Court. After a counter coalition of private landowners and uranium mining interests sued the state of Mexico on the grounds that this permanent designation violated them of their individual property rights. So land as extractive capital. The case bypassed all the appellate courts and went straight to the state Supreme Court and to the surprise of very many in 2014, a ruling was issued 
that the traditional cultural property designation was not in violation of due process, and today the mountain stands as a permanent cultural property for many Native Americans in the area. Soko's image text concretizes the symbolic power of intangible cultural property and heritage, such as sacred stories and oral traditions about origins, to signify in latent, ostensibly secular legal spaces. This kind of significatory power manifests how the aesthetic can articulate values that purely economic forms of development simply cannot speak or utter, and can productively disrupt sustainability out of its normative association with forms of extractive capitalism. Thank you. If I may just very briefly, in, in 30 seconds, I had to put this up. Three days ago, our administration issued yet another executive order about monuments. reviewing national monuments. Yeah. This is an image of the, um, the Beresier Monument in Utah, mm -hmm. which seems to be first on the list. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I'm motioning to this because I have to temper my optimism about the aesthetic to signify in legal spaces. Those legal spaces are very precarious and fragile, and uh, the battle goes on. responsibility for the natural world, and hence are making a contribution to this larger project of building sustainable communities in a thriving earth. A foundational understanding of sacramentality rests in the potential of the living earth in all its dimensionality to reveal the presence and action of the divine, and allow divine life and divine generosity present in the multifaceted jewel we call the earth to shine through. This understanding of sacramentality, while Christian, resonates with perceptions of the numinous quality of the cosmos and the earth that are cultivated in many other traditions and forms of eco-spirituality. A renewed sense of, of sacramentality can reawaken perceptions of the integrity and mystery and beauty of the living earth at, time, at a time when so many of her creatures and ecosystems are threatened and exploited and can bring a new appreciation of the planet as a creative, self-organizing, and living presence deeply <coughs> rooted in the creative energies of the divine spirit that is birthing and sustaining the universe in all its complexity. And it can invite a new embrace of Earth's goods and resources, not simply as extractable sources of wealth, but as precious and meaningful participants in a diverse and mutually responsive universe. In what follows, I will touch on four aspects of a renewed engagement with sacramentality that can contribute to the healing and future well-being of the planetary community. First, the cultivation of a sacramental consciousness. Second, a renewal of rituals described as sacraments. Third, a recommitment to the ethical responsibilities for the web of life that flows from these sacramental rites. And fourth, a new appreciation of the earth commons as a sacred and sacramental commons for the whole earth community. The crises that surround us today invite a new awakening of a sacramental consciousness, a cultivated awareness of the intrinsic value, beauty, fragility, and mystery of the earth community. This sacramental consciousness is an aesthetic and a religious intuition, a spiritual sensibility that intuits the more, the surplus of meaningfulness, the vital and vivifying power of the divine 
alive in every seed, every waterfall, and every suffering face. A sacramental consciousness is a way of seeing the earth as a sacred place, imbued with creativity and spiritual energy that presses forward towards evergreening life and well-being, is to view the web of interrelated creatures with eyes of love and care, with respect and gratitude for the mystery and complexity of life itself. Sacramental consciousness is a relational sensibility, engaging emotion and heart knowing that responds in wonder and awe in the face of a majestic mountain, or the resilience of a blade of grass breaking through the pavement, or the immensity of the heavens laden with stars on a clear, dark night, especially here outside of the city. But it also leaps in the face of the destruction and degradation of Earth's precious resources, the polluting of her waterways, and the burning of her forests. Today especially, a sacramental consciousness involves the ability to feel in oneself the vulnerability and suffering of so many of Earth's creatures, the assault on their intrinsic value and their right to respect and care from the human community. In his recent encyclical, Laudato Si, Pope Francis invites all who share this Earth as a common home to experience what is happening in the world as our own personal suffering to feel the desertification of the soil almost as a physical ailment and the extinction of a species as a painful disfigurement. Sacramental consciousness is a perception of kinship that perceives the human community as embedded in life processes, as participants in Earth's rhythms and seasons, as kin to others in the web of interrelated species. A sacramental consciousness takes hold in communities as it is cultivated, nourished, and fostered. It grows from direct encounter with the earth in all its complexities, with gardens and soil microbes, with splendid vistas and meandering creeks, with flocks of geese stretched in flight across the heavens, with bees and spiders and toads, with a living earth springing up in unexpected places. It flourishes from an engagement in spiritual practices that are earth-centered, that cultivate appreciation of otherness, that invite curiosity and a willingness to learn, that engage persons and communities subjectively in a world of subjects. A sacramental consciousness is a doorway to deeper communion with all that is, a contemplative knowing that can ground the courageous resistance and prophetic action needed to speak out against the desecration of the planet and her inhabitants, and to create new pathways for human living that can sustain generations to come. It is also a source for the renewal of religious rites described as sacraments, rituals that make use of Earth's elements as symbols of divine action, water for baptism, oil for anointing and chrismation, bread and wine, earth's fruits for Eucharistic meal, human touch and embrace. Each of these elements in its own unique way is revelatory of divine engagement in the lives of persons and communities at particular moments in their human and spiritual journeys. Today, an awakened sense of sacramental consciousness can bring a new vigor and vibrancy to these rites connecting them more dynamically to the pulse of the living world, heightening awareness on the part of participants of the deep and luminous mystery that resides in these earth connections. Water used lavishly in rites of baptism calls attention not only to divine action in the ritual itself, but invites awareness of the sacredness of all of earth's waters as precious gift and finite resource. Moreover, these rituals involved an implicit layering of references to the natural world and to the rhythms of Earth's seasons. Baptism, for example, whose central symbolism is the pouring or immersing bodies in water as a sign of rebirth, is richly connected to the patterns of birth and death and rebirth that are present in the natural world. In the Northern Hemisphere, baptism is most often celebrated near the spring equinox when the full moon is at its apex and the earth is in the full throes of awakening 
rebirthing and budding forth. Hence, to be baptized into a community of faith is likewise to be invited into the great cosmological web of life in all its rich patterns and processes. To engage Earth's elements in sacramental rites, water, oil, bread, wine, is to be summoned to responsibility for the well-being of these very elements, to a responsibility for the future of Earth's abundance. An ethical imperative is implicit in sacramental rites, an ethical response that gives witness to the fruitfulness of the rite in the lives of those who participate. In a word, to be committed to baptismal waters at one moment in life's journey is to be committed to Earth's waters for life. Indeed, the waters blessed, poured, and welcomed in baptism are drawn from a community's local waters, the interconnected waterways of their local watershed, streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans that create home and habitat for all creatures who co-abide there, waters that are dependent on the care and susceptible to the degradation of those who use them. A sensitive and evocative use of water and baptism invites a community to join with others in taking responsibility for the health and just distribution of these local waters and to commit themselves to maintaining the delicate ecological balance necessary for the well-being of future generations who will live in this place and draw on these waters. <clears throat> Moreover, the baptismal blessing and pouring of water opens out to the larger earth commons to the needs of the global community of life for clean and adequate water, and calls the community to take action with others against whatever destroys the natural habitats and ecosystems, where water sustains life and increases beauty. Finally, all that I've explored so far comes together in the emergence of a sacramental awakening of a deeper sacramental consciousness, together with religious rites made more vivid by an increased earth connectedness, can summon communities to a deeper ethical responsibility, not only for the earth elements used ritually, but also for the broader earth commons, those globally interconnected ecosystems that thrive in relationship to each other, that together are the common good, indeed the common goods of all peoples and living creatures. As sacramental sensibilities are nurtured in communities, the earth commons takes on a new valence as a sacred and sacramental commons, a place where the social and ecological meaning of the commons are joined to a spiritual perception of the earth as the dwelling place of the life-giving spirit of God. Human care for earth's resources become a partnership, not only with the rest of the biotic community of life, but also with the creative and caring energies of the divine spirit. The earth commons becomes both a spiritual and an ecological resource for future generations, a sacred habitat for all who dwell here, a spiritual legacy with intrinsic value held in trust for generations to come. In closing, I want to thank the authors with whom I was in conversation for so greatness. Thank you. here at the GTU, he teaches, he takes care of all of us, and his talk tonight is, I mean today, is entitled Healing Creation or Hearing Confession, the Role of Agency, Sickness, and Repentance in the Current Ecological Crisis. So, unlike my day job where I'm dealing with this screen all the time, I opted to not have a PowerPoint, so this will be good. <laughs> Um, be very interesting. So what I'm, what I'm offering you are some preliminary observations um, based on some of the work I did in my dissertation on the pastoral care of the sick. In the past few decades, healing language has become ubiquitous in describing potential resolutions to the ecological crisis. 
and such language has made its way into the worship practices of communities. With calls for the healing of creation by theologians, ethicists, and religious practitioners, the assumption is that creation is the one that is sick. This way of thinking is supported in some of the scientific literature, which also des describes the environment as being sick. At the basic level, then, something or someone is causing the environment to be sick. My main point of departure, as I mentioned, comes from my work in liturgical studies and the analysis of the rights for the pastoral care of the sick. And so what I propose are just some challenges to the language which will be kind of my entree into figuring out alternatives to this. Writers of theological treatises, hymns, sermons, and prayers often describe the hoped for reversing of ecological disasters as healing. Usually the texts ask that God serve as the primary agent who heals creation. While petitioning God is appropriate and scriptural evidence supports this approach, the language can have two negative results misplacing culpability for sins, and making sickness seem less severe for those who suffer from physical and mental sickness and hope for physical and mental well-being. To paraphrase a title of a book from about 40 years ago, Whatever Became of Sin. So as a, as a good Lutheran, I talk about sin a lot. Um, Lutheran eco-theologian Paul Santmeyer urges us to engage at with this, but he urges us to give so-called caution to the so-called fall. He says, with the whole, while the whole of nature has not fallen, the human relationship with nature has fallen. So another way of stating this is that humans and nature have a misrelation. Roman Catholic theologian Dennis Edwards also cautions us from too quickly dismissing the fall and its doctrine of original sin. He writes, quote, the theology of original sin challenges all romantic views of humanity, all uncritical views of evolutionary progress, all idealistic visions of the future, all naive revolutionary utopias, with radical realism about humanity." End quote. Recognizing and dealing with this honest appraisal of the human condition is an important step before becoming a responsible member of the community of creation. Such a realistic view of the human condition seems to find support in biology. Religious scholar David Bryant reminds us that humans are part of nature and that, quote, human biology limits the degree to which human motivations and actions are changed, end quote. By drawing on scientific literature, Bryant notes that living things naturally live, as they are, in such a way that can exploit the environment around them. Yet Bryant doesn't believe that this necessarily leads to a fatalistic conclusion. Rather, he insists that eco-theologians take biology into account when developing their responses to ecology. So my direction is looking at the issue of responsibility and agency. Sins, in the plural, sins with an S at the end, are actual sins that are done, as David, Tracy, or David Kelsey would say, acts done consciously and deliberately against God's will, end quote. Yet one of the major questions is who is responsible for the discrete sinful acts that human beings commit. In analyzing Augustine's concepts of sin and original sin, Jesse Cohenhoven uses the language of deep responsibility to refer to what properly belongs to the human capacity, which separates responsibility from freedom. And he argues that this concept of deep responsibility is compatible with divine grace. Otherwise, God would be a divine puppet master who puts humans through the motions, but they really do not have a will. This understanding of responsibility assumes agency, but not necessarily blame. Cohen Hoban writes, quote, One of the main differences is that blaming a person implies thinking or speaking of someone about that person as evil, while considering a person deeply responsible for something implies that that person fulfills certain standards of agency. Associating blame to a particular individual would assume that such individual has free will in all things, and that individual chose not to exercise the free will. A deeply responsible person has actions appropriately attributed to her or him, and from that standing, the person may be open to being praised or blamed. 
So Cohenhaven nicely summarizes the difference in this language when he writes, quote, to sin is to malfunction as a person in relationship, to believe, desire, and thus act, or simply be properly. By contrast, a mere disease, we take on the sickness language, is a condition of the brain or of the body that, that inhibits the proper function of the human brain or body in supporting personal existence. As a personal evil, sin involves more than malfunction, because in addition to being a misrelation to oneself, sin always involves misrelating to others. End quote. Ryan comes to a similar conclusion about freedom and responsibility from the realm of biology. He concludes that, quote, given current scientific insights into the human brain or mind, it may be better to speak of the ability to survey options and make intentional choices rather than of free will, end quote. To counter determinism, Brian argues that things, are, things people experience and glean, warnings about potential dangers and appeals to a sense of responsibility and possibility, can and frequently do become part of the input to the brain and affect this activity, sometimes even adding to our reconfiguration, reconfiguring its schemata. So in the realm of pedagogy, this is constructivism. Thus, this biological approach finds parallelism in the cognitive sciences, where knowledge is not transmitted tabula rasa, but instead is constructed based on external and internal stimuli. But even this is limited based on one's biological need to affect one's environment, as was stated earlier. In an article published only a year ago, a Lutheran liturgical scholar, one of my colleagues in Chicago, Benjamin Stewart, observes that a legalistic approach to the current discussion about ritual ways of dealing with environmental sin. He critiques the sin language and places the, um, because it places humans and the environment in competition with each other. This sin as zero-sum legal trade-off, as he puts it, can lead Christians to thinking that correcting environmental sin would be of detriment to humans, and thus would not be something for which the average Christian or any religious person would advocate. So that is why he um, articulates an attempt to use sickness language. He thinks it may provide a better alternative of dealing ritually and theologically with the environment. But the sickness language can conflate biology with theology, as Lutheran disability theologian Sharon Betcher has argued. If sickness is used as a figure of speech to describe sins committed against God's will for the environment, or as a means of describing the misrelationship between humans and creation, then sickness language as applied to medical suffering may be understood also as figurative. In that medical perspective, someone who is chronically sick may be considered disabled. So does that extend to meaning that in the current ecological crisis, it would be appropriate to speak of the environment as being disabled. Venture, of course, says no, and I would agree with her. She notes, quote, seemingly ever the problem in need of a solution, disablement already, always already evokes resolve, end quote. In the case of the ecological crisis, I think that all of us here would like that resolution. Creating and fostering a sustainable society is one of our major goals, and certainly the goal of this conference. At the same time, the language used in one direction influences how the language is used in the other. If in our task to heal the sickness of the earth or resolve the disability of creation, we ignore those who themselves live with sickness and disability and rather use that language as a tool, we can fall into a practice of colonization of language, which places and keeps its beneficiaries in a dependent relation, as Betcher knows. On the other hand, some theologies have posited a relationship between concepts of sin and the environment that are less healthy. Anthropologist Norda Johnson describes her observation of the healing the land evangelical movement in the Canadian Arctic. This movement sees a causal link between sin and the environment, such that any sins, and she, the, the documentation lists bloodshed, adultery, breaking the government, and idolatry as the sins, they are seen as having a defect, direct effect on environmental degradation. And not just things, not just those sins committed against the environment. Any sin causes environmental degradation in this healing the land movement. 
For this movement, good stewardship of land means perpetually avoiding sin. Since sin can be transmitted from one generation to the other. It's a familial issue. The only way to overcome this problem is to, as the movement's name suggests, heal the land. Johnson notes that this healing consists of identifying and naming intergenerational sins and restore proper communal relations. Through a ritual of publicly naming sins, asking for forgiveness, rededicating the land, and anointing the land, the land is purified and God changes God's mind about the environment. That's the theological conclusion. Johnson believes such an approach is attractive to residents because it provides them with a sense of collective agency in dealing with change. But for Johnson, and I agree with her assessment here, this focus on spiritual agency can detract from concrete socioeconomic and political effects on the environment. South African religious scholar David uh, Field argues that, quote, to confess that Jesus Christ is Redeemer and Lord demands of the church to repent of its complicity in the destruction of God's creation and commit itself to the practices of ecological healing. End quote. So in his one, his statement, he sees healing and um, repentance as related, but not as the same. Field argues that creation means to be in covenantal relationship with the creator and in communion with the rest of creation. If such claim is true, then one could locate the ecological crisis in the breach or fraction of this relationship in communion. This repairing the breach approach is often most associated with rites of reconciliation, penance, or confession. Field concurs with this by placing, by noting that, quote, authentic confession of faith in and obedience of Jesus to Jesus Christ begins with confession of sin, end quote. This confession of sin is both individual and communal. The former relating to how humans hold responsibility and agency for specific actions against the environment, and the latter is about the church's role as a participant in that crisis. So what are the liturgical implications for this? This is where I'm still working. Satmeyer views the liturgy as the place where participants engage in identity formation. In my own work, I have referred to this as a situational approach to ritual efficacy that the liturgy or the rituals create a situation in which something is formed. This approach means that what occurs in worship actually does something. Otherwise, why study it, I guess. Um, yet liturgical theologian Gordon Lathrop reminds us that Christian liturgy does not necessarily provide an answer to the ecological crisis. Rather, he argues that the modesty of liturgical symbols may serve as a disruption of an uncritical worldview. I think this relates very nicely to what Mary was positing with a kind of sacramental approach. Lathrop encourages congregations to let the liturgy do what it is intended to do, primarily to hold us before God and bring us to faith in God. Even in this worshiping community, one must take care not to distort the liturgy while addressing issues of ecological concern. Some recent liturgical resources put forward suggestions that deviate from the lectionary tradition of sequential readings in favor of selecting texts that quote-unquote force the preacher or congregation to focus on aspects of the environment. Lathrop sees such an approach as clouding the clarity of God speaking through the liturgy by implying what he calls a narrow, ethical, or political agenda. What might such liturgical practice look like, holding this tension of agency and reconciliation, this tension of suffering and responsibility? What I've argued through the paper is that rites of reconciliation, like confession and forgiveness, may provide us some opportunities that have been overlooked because of our uneasiness with the language of sin or sins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, our next paper, we're going to hear from Professor John Plantos from the Patriarch of the Birth Orthodox Institute and the GTU. And Dr. Plantos' title today is Sustainability in Eastern Orthodox Christian Liturgy.
I'd like to begin by expressing my thanks to the Graduate Theological Union and to the GTU Mira and AJ Shingle Center for Dharma Studies for sponsoring this exciting and important conference, and to Professor Rita Sherma for her kind invitation to be part of this panel. Although a lesser known minority tradition in the United States, the Eastern Orthodox Church is the second most populous Christian church in the world behind the Roman Catholic Church. Taking into account the history and culture shared by the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Oriental Orthodox Churches, and the Eastern Rite Catholic Churches, the material I will be presenting today represents theological perspectives common to a large segment of the Christian world. Orthodox Christianity developed a good deal of its foundational theology and spiritual roots before the canon of Christian scriptures was established. Even then, its basic monastic character developed in the context of Palestinian and Egyptian deserts, where even the monastics who could read had little to no easy access to written books of scripture. Their piety was based on the lived, the lived witness of elders and the Psalms, which were usually committed to memory. The result is that the Orthodox spiritual practice is grounded in scripture without being directly connected with extended scriptural texts. The basic character of Orthodox Christianity originated by holy men and women who fled society to live their faith in the desert. Even today, Orthodox Christians find spiritual guidance in the sayings of desert fathers and mothers who articulated a particular relationship between humans and nature. Their radical simplicity was marked by profound respect for nature. John the eunuch instructed his disciples, My children, let us not pollute this place, since our fathers and mothers have previously cleansed it from demons. Awareness of the natural world fostered an awareness of God's creative love, and respect for the environment was an expression of respect for God and God's creation. According to their thought, one aspect of achieving spiritual purity was reestablishing the harmony between humans and the rest of creation that was a characteristic of the life of the first people in paradise prior to the fall. In one story, Paul of Thebes would hold asps, asps snakes, and scorpions in his hands. When asked about this by others, he remarked that when a person acquires purity, humans are restored to a positive relationship with even the most deadly of animals, as it was in paradise before humans contravened the commandment of God. This respectful coexistence between humans and animals is evident in several edifying stories. Abba Anthony maintained a small garden to sustain himself, but wild animals would often trample the plants when they came for water. One day, he managed to catch one of the animals and, holding it gently, asked, Why do you harm me when I harm none of you? After he asked that they respect his garden, the animals never disturbed his plants again. One elderly monk shared his meager supply of dates with a lion. Another monk regularly dined with a wolf. A lion helped Abba Zosimus dig a grave to bury Mary of Egypt, who had died in the desert. A Syriac poem on hermits and desert dwellers from late antiquity speaks of those who graze on grass and roots instead of delicacies. Their idyllic existence is described in detail. When one has the chance, he gathers small herbs and eats. He enjoys the herbs he picked in faith. He leaves the rest behind and moves on from there because he heard the saying, do not be anxious about tomorrow. This awareness of primordial harmony among creation and yearning for a relationship hearkening back to paradise was articulated by people as eminent as the Cappadocian Fathers. Basil the Great, in his work on the human condition, noted that when God told the firstborn humans, Behold, I have given you every tree which has fruit in itself. It will be to you for food. God does not say, I have given you the fishes for food. I have given you the domestic animals, the reptiles, the quadrupeds to eat. 
For he did not create those things for this purpose, as Scripture says. But the first legislation granted enjoyment of fruits, for we were still reckoned to be worthy of paradise. Animals were created to enjoy God's paradise and to praise God together with humans, not to be food for people. Basil notes that it was only after the fall of humanity and all of creation with humanity and the great flood that God permitted humans to eat animals. Indeed, a significant aspect of Orthodox Christian spiritual life is dedicated to restoring the harmonious relationships of paradise. Today, certain feasts of the church year are observed with special blessings of food and drink. On January 1st, a special, blood is, a special bread is blessed, both in churches and in private homes. January 6th is marked by a sacramental, really, blessing of water at church. On the Feast of the Transfiguration, August 6th, grapes are blessed. Fragrant herbs are blessed in the Feast of the Dormition of Mary on August 15th. Meat, cheese, and eggs are blessed after the Easter liturgy. Major saints' commemorations include the blessing of bread, wine, and oil. Several services interceding for the repose of the departed and asking for the intercessions of saints involves blessing boiled wheat. While time doesn't permit for an in-depth analysis of the prayer text associated with these blessings, and in the Orthodox tradition, no prayers are ever extemporaneous, a few observations are worthwhile. First, even bread, oil, and wine are never spoken of as being the work of human hands. They are quite simply things that the earth has produced for our enjoyment and nourishment. They recall the ritual food sacrifices made to God in pre-Christian times and remember Jesus Christ's care for the hungry. The praying community is reminded that God's care for all creation, temperate winds, measured rainfall, and gentle weather, is the true source of all that we eat and drink. It's not surprising that a faith tradition that sustained people in agrarian societies gave thanks at times of harvest. The blessing of honey and honeycombs make reference to God's caring for the children of Israel by providing them honey from a rock. Blessing new wine brings to mind the miracle of Canaan and Galilee where God's glory was manifested. Herbs are blessed with a reminder that plants exist because God commanded the earth to bring forth every fruit in its own season and to give it for joy, for life, to humankind. It is remarkable that even when people toil to cultivate and harvest, the prayers of the Orthodox Church were silent about human efforts to farm and spoke of them solely as the fruits of God's command, the earth's bounty, and nature's nurture. This is a discreet admonition to humility by recognizing humanity's true place in the grander scheme of creation. In fact, this order, and remembrance of this order, is fundamental to the Orthodox Christian's private devotion and practices. One major aspect of personal devotion within the Orthodox tradition is the practice of fasting. Again, this is another vast topic to which volumes could be devoted. Here I can only offer the briefest of thumbnail sketches. The general term fasting actually refers to a range of eating practices, from a very strict avoidance of all food and drink, even water, to abstaining from meat or dairy or both for an extended period of time, while reducing both the number of meals taken each day and the amount of food and drink consumed. In common practice today, fasting usually means that a person is going vegan or going vegetarian. At the top of the official calendar of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople is a list of important information, like the date of Easter, the days of the week on which major feasts fall, and something I always enjoy checking out, the number of days that meat eating is allowed <laughs> if one follows all the church's regulations scrupulously. In 2017, meat consumption will be allowed 57 days. 
I must make it clear at this point that this strict discipline is not reserved only for monastics, but is presented as the ideal for which each and every Christian should strive. Remembering the influence of the monastic tradition and its respect for all of creation, recalling St. Basil's homily encouraging a return to the prelapsarian practice of eating only fruits and vegetables, these fasting practices point to an ethical return to paradise. For Orthodox faithful, the most vivid and compelling part of the year, comprising roughly one-third of the calendar, is the period of Great Lent and Easter, or Pascha. The Feast of the Resurrection of Christ, the Feast of Feasts and Festival of Festivals, is preceded by a strict, almost entirely vegan, fast of about two months. Great Lent begins with a course reading of Genesis, recalling the creation of all things and the life of the first formed humans in paradise. The hymns of the church remind worshipers that Adam and Eve's decision to eat the forbidden fruit was actually the sin of refusing to fast. And through this sin, the entire equilibrium of creation was destroyed. The Byzantinist Eric Kruger has pointed out recently that the hymns of Lent, of the, first, uh, of the entire period of Lent, personalize the first sin and fall of creation by casting the vast majority of these hymns in the first person singular. I am responsible for the disruption of creation because of my gluttony, my greed, my refusal to fast. The entire Lenten season is an extended meditation of my responsibility for sin and evil in the world. Guided by the church's hymns, I embark on restoring God's intended order in creation through a personal discipline of prayer, fasting, and deliberate cultivation of loving mercy demonstrated through works of kindness. Of course, ultimately, salvation is achieved only by God's work through Jesus Christ, but human cooperation is an integral part of manifesting God's saving work in the world. When the joyful resurrection is proclaimed, however, there's a profound shift from first person singular to cosmic celebration. The great canon of Easter, traditionally attributed to St. John of Damascus, calls out, let the heavens, as is fitting, rejoice, and let the earth be glad. Let the whole world, both seen and unseen, keep the feast. For Christ has risen, our eternal gladness. The joy of God's salvation is not reserved for humans alone, but is enjoyed by all creation. Indeed, this is true not only for Pascha, but for other great feasts of the Lord. At Christmas, the hymns proclaim, when the, when the Lord Jesus was born of the Holy Virgin, all the world was enlightened. Let heaven and earth today make glad prophetically. Heaven and earth are united today for Christ is born. At the, face, at the, at the Feast of Epiphany, which in Orthodox tradition celebrates Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan, the hymns cry out, Today the creation is enlightened. Today all nature is glad, things of heaven and things upon earth. Let the whole earthly creation clothe itself in white, for this day it is raised up from its fall from heaven. Through the incarnation and through Christ's saving works, all creation is redeemed and renewed. Humans, animals, plants, rocks, water, all celebrate their restoration. According to an Orthodox Christian understanding of reality, Sustainability can be seen, and has been seen, as a discipline that involves each human in his or her totality, physical, spiritual, psychological, and emotional, with the goal of restoring the delicate balance of all creation as it existed in paradise. The initial sin of gluttony led to the disruption of all creation, and the incarnation provided the opportunity for humans empowered by the Holy Spirit to return to a responsible coexistence with the rest of creation. On a liturgical level, the church constantly calls all of creation to rejoice in God's salvation. It reminds the humans of their responsibilities 
and encourages them to live in harmony with all of nature. The desert monastics continue to inspire Orthodox Christians to live simply in loving relationships with plants and animals. Paradise is not a distant, mythical land, but a, pro a present reality to be recognized and embraced. In the words of St. Sophronius' grand prayer for the blessing of water and epiphany, Today, the grace of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descended upon the waters. Today, the sun that never sets has risen, and the world is filled with the splendor by the light of the Lord. Today the moon shines upon the world with the brightness of its rays. Today the glittering stars make the inhabited earth fair with the radiance of their shining. Today the clouds drop down the dew of righteousness from on high. Today the whole creation is watered by mystical streams. Today paradise has been opened. Today the whole creation shines with light from on high. Today earth and sea share the joy of the world. And the world is filled with gladness. For by your own will you have brought all things out of non-being into being, and by your power you hold together the creation, and by your providence you govern the world. All the spiritual powers tremble before you, the sun sings your praises, the moon glorifies you, the stars supplicate before you, the light obeys you, the deeps are afraid of your presence, the fountains are your servants. You have poured forth the air that living things may breathe. So, by the elements, by the angels, and by humans, by things seen and unseen, may your most holy name be glorified, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, John. Okay, our next speaker is Colette Walker. Colette is a doctoral candidate at the GTU, and her talk is entitled, This is Precisely the Time When Artists Go to Work. The arts, activism, and sustainability in troubled times. So first I'd like to um, say a small apology. I had some beautiful images to go with this, which somehow didn't make it onto my memory stick. <laughs> it was bound to happen someday, and so today's the day. Uh, fortunately, uh, the talk doesn't rely on those, they were just um, bonus. So. In 2015 article for The Nation, author Toni Morrison recalls a conversation she had with an artist friend soon after the re-election of George W. Bush in 2004. Morrison was expressing her deep discouragement and sense of helplessness when her friend called her short, called her up short to say the following. Um, no, 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 he told her. This, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. Not when everything is fine, but in times of dread. That is our job. This, Morrison tells us, helped snap her out of her despair, reminded her of the many artists who have persevered under the most dire conditions and oppressive regimes that sought to suppress the imagination that art provides. In her article, she likewise exhorts her fellow artists who are currently experiencing challenging times to go to work. In her words, there is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. Mm. Morrison's words and the understanding of art's role that they convey have clearly resonated with many artists, especially in the wake of the recent presidential election and here in the Bay Area after the tragedy of Ghost Ship. They've been making the rounds on social media and they, you may know, have even been quoted at the Grammys recently. In the Bay Area alone, such conversations, um, I'm sorry, there, there's likewise been a burgeoning of discussions among politically engaged artists about just what such going to work entails in the current climate of political crisis. In the Bay Area alone, such conversations have been taking place regularly in the form of a, a dizzying, I mean, seriously, so many 
um, scheduled talks, artist talks, panels, roundtables, artist actions, um, not to mention, of course, all of the private conversations that are going on among artists. And I'll, um, it's, it's been a seriously uh, such a topic of what can we as artists do. <laughs> I'll just give you a couple of the many, many events that I've been aware of, and I'm sure many of you may be aware of many more. One of these was the 100 Days Action, artists responding to Trump's 100 Day Plan. Uh, this was a plan, a project that was initiated by a small group of artists who then called on the larger artistic community in order to stage and perform and make in, uh, in response in a counter narrative to what Trump is trying to do. Um, so that, that is just about to end. The last two days are, are happening. Uh, this weekend, if you want to join in the two-day dance party that's happening in the city. <laughs> One of the venues at which uh, some of these events have taken place is the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, which has long been a, a focal point for um, activist art and socially engaged art in the Bay Area. They call themselves the Bay Area's Creative Poem for Civic Action. They are currently hosting the 24-hour resistance um, don't wish for it, work for it. This they are calling a, um, a fitness center for building sustained resistance. Um, it's, a, um, it's free to the public, circuit training studio to warm up your artivism. <laughs> <laughs> Another event that took place in February was Blessed Unrest. Um, I believe there was even um, uh, Marvin White, one of uh, the alumni of uh, one of our programs here took part in this. Uh, this is an arts and social justice festival that was a two-day event. It included uh, many performances, spoken word, dance, song, um, also workshops, and panel discussions specifically on this topic. What is the role of arts and activism in the Trump era? Uh, many others that I want just to mention one last one at CIIS recently, there was a talk by Daniel Drake, who is a poet and expressive arts therapist, talking on <clears throat> social change through expressive arts. And that is available online, if you're interested. <clears throat> um, and of course, we've all seen the many grassroots creative activities of people protesting through um, a creative use of signs, through the hats, so there's been a lot of creative response of, of Welling in the past few months. So it's, it's been a very rich and multi-vocal array of exploration in this present moment. Um, what's perhaps new is the urgency of conversations and also the fact that many in the audience are new to activism. And so, so this has been I think an important and helpful conversation that longtime veterans of activism are having to both to shore themselves up in the face of so many rollbacks to things they've worked so hard for, and also to bring in new people who are just feeling their way into this. So some of the recurrent themes are using art strategically and tactically as a component of direct political action, in order to get the word out, rally the troops, or present information in a new and perhaps engaging way, changing people's minds, ideally express critique. So, so this is kind of one family of themes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and and maybe this family is the more direct action and cognitively oriented focus. But there's another significant theme, and I think this is where this, these current conversations intersect with what we've been talking about here today and tomorrow, and that is um, the question of how the arts can help sustain the activist community. And, and this is the conversation that seems to be perhaps, um, I won't say more tentative, but exploratory. 
because it seems that the artists that I've been listening to feel pretty confident that they know their strategies for how to initiate direct action and to function in that more activist way, whereas this it has not so often been directed at the activist community itself. So um, I will say too, I'll step back a second and say, my own experience here is um, that I am, I am an art historian and I spend most of the time with my head in the early 20th century. So stepping into contemporary art is not my usual area. Um, so it's kind of exploratory for me. But the artists that I do look at are the socially engaged artists of that earlier period, and specifically the different ways in which artists have historically tried to bring about change through art. So it's been fascinating for me to watch these conversations unfolding in real time. So it's, it's actually in development right now. And, and it's also interesting to me the differences in what I see right now compared to what my artists, <laughs> my early 20th century people, were limited by, I would say. Uh, I was going to, I was going to show you some images of, of some of the historic um, um, uh, explorations or experiments that artists have engaged in, in earlier eras. Um, so I don't have the, the images, um, certainly, but I will just very briefly say, when I look at the historical periods of the 19th and early 20th century, there are really, I, I would say, two main groupings or orientations of artists who are trying to change the world through art. One, I would say, I mean, to really boil it down and simplify it, would be a more inward orientation, you could say a more spiritual orientation. Uh, this would be stemming from the romantic tradition and, and um, really? No, okay. The more, from the romantic tradition in which the artist was seen as um, like a priest of a sort or a prophet, perhaps a healer. And then uh, this would include, for example, German Romanticism, um, symbolism of the turn of the century with very um, mystical imagery. And also people like early 20th century artist Vasily Kandinsky, who famously wrote a book named Concerning the Spiritual in Art, which advocated for artists depicting, uh, well, dropping recognizable subject matter so that they could depict higher states of consciousness, basically, and thereby help society evolve to a higher spiritual level. On the other side, you have what I could call the realist trend, in which artists focus on more of the exterior, exterior conditions of society, like social inequality, poverty. You can see this in mid-19th century uh, France, people like Corbet depicting the peasants in the countryside and their hard work. Um, in the 20th century, some examples would be Depression era artists, including photographers, documenting the um, Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, child labor. So these would be more documentary in a sense, as opposed to trying to heal individuals on a deeper level and thereby society. This would also include the more, um, the more, um, uh, let's see, uh, protest art. This also would include things like protest art and satire. We're seeing a lot of that right now, obviously, but it's not new to our own era, of course. Uh, so, over that period that I tend to stay in, these two trajectories, these two orientations, didn't often meet up. They tended to be two separate camps. Most of the artists would orient towards one or the other, um, and sometimes they were even seen as mutually exclusive. 
uh, especially when you had artists of a of a Marxist bent who were completely dead set against any kind of spirituality and art. Along with that, there has definitely been a hermeneutics of suspicion among a lot of art scholars and art critics in the past, say, 50 years about any kind of more spiritually engaged transformation possible through art. Um, that's what I find in my own field of art history, like coming to a, a group like this, I can actually talk about spirituality without batting an eye, but when I prepare a lecture like this, usually I'm like, oh, you could call it maybe spirituality. <laughs> but um, it's been very, very um, unapproachable in many academic settings. <clears throat> so, so what I'm finding very interesting now is that some of the more recent um, developments in art of the past several decades are coming into play. These would be, for example, the greater number of voices who enter into the conversation um, with, with the um, greater access to becoming artists of, say, women and people of color, the conversation is much more diverse than it was in the period I studied. Um, and I'd also say, uh, some of you I know were in the previous, um, the previous panel discussion, I'd also say that experiments in, um, in social um, communities have also played a role in how artists, think, artists are thinking about what they can do now. Um, so it also has come into art directly in the work of people like Joseph Boyce, who is a German artist, say 50s, 60s, 70s, who uh, practiced what he called social sculpture, basically performances of a rather ritual nature intended to heal society, heal a community, heal our relationship with nature. Um, and also more recent community-based art, where artists will go into a community and do some kind of work with that community. And it doesn't always look like art, but the result is a greater sense of cohesion, revitalization. So bringing us back to um, these recent conversations, and I will try to wrap it up because I think I'm out of time. Um, so bringing it back, there are a number of themes, a number of strategies that come up in this regard. And um, those include especially, uh, in this regard meaning, how do we sustain our, our own community of artists, activists? How can we keep our spirits up? How can we stay energized? How can we increase our um, alliances with each other? bring together groups that haven't previously seen themselves as allies or as closely affiliated. And so among the things I've heard quite a bit are um, an emphasis on relational or dialogic forms of art, art that allows voices to be heard that haven't typically been heard so that people can understand each other, people can join in relationship together. Um, also movement and performance, uh, not just receiving it, but doing it. So there's a lot of emphasis on bodily movement. You, as a person who needs sustenance, needs to get involved and move. And not just for a purpose to change somebody's mind, but because you need it. And there's also discussion, <coughs> excuse me, discussion of studies that have been done recently that, that show that such making, such moving, has direct um, benefit for one's health, for one's resilience. So in conclusion, it seems to me that first of all, there's a broader community of artists who are working together, who are talking together. More voices are allowed to be uh, joining in the conversation. So there are more tools more tools in the toolbox, more opportunities to use aspects of art that have been re rejected, even rejected outright in earlier generations, but 
not only to get a, a message across, but to keep the community itself uh, sustained. So thank you very much.
The Senate, much to the dismay of the Bush administration, approved her amendment by a vote of 52 to 48, which temporarily stopped the plans to drill the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Refuge. His photograph was fundamental in this process. It elicited empathy, a sense of urgency. It circulated through the bodies and the minds of those who were present and who were about to vote. His of is so striking because it combines artistic imagination, environmental texts, so every time he ex um, has an exhibition, the catalog, instead of describing how he produced the image or give some art historical information on the image, talks about the environmental um, degradation of the particular um, place that he's uh, photographing. So they gesture toward an alternative way of viewing the environment and all of its entanglements. In this image, for example, the migration of the caribou does not only happen in a remote, uninhabited wilderness that is ripe with raw material for extraction, wealth, power development. Instead, what is revealed to us is the ways in which this landscape is the very common home for several species. His aerial perspective provides a glimpse of the web of life that encompasses different species and their environments in the Arctic. Taken together, his photographs and environmental texts reveal how intimately connected to local and global ecosystems we really are. I am not sure what would dissuade the Trump administration from the imminent defunding of several government departments, including the Environmental Protection Agency. Perhaps David Buckland's projections onto the foot of crumbling glaciers could work towards sensitizing the Congress. His ice texts have haunting effects. They encourage us to engage with these melting glaciers as ecosystems that are slowly dying. To him, the language, of glaci the language glaciers speak um, is as clear as words. They collapse um, and tell the tale of how their collapse, the glaciers collapse, tell the tale of how we're implicated in the death of this ice. The ecological urgency we're living through today, he writes, isn't being communicated successfully enough to provoke real change and mitigate climate change. Anthropogenic climate change threatens us all with an uncertain physical, social, and economic future. So why are we not engaged in sorting out our future, he asks. Masia Erland's project, A Gathering of Waters, <coughs> was designed to do just that, raise public awareness and call forth action to change the current precarity of the Rio, Rio Grande. It united a diverse group of people, including, including artists, members of government agencies, Native American leaders, private water users, farmers, ranchers, all of which, all of whom uh, lived close to the 1,800-mile uh, stretch of the Rio Grande Basin. So basically what they had to do was to take a little bit of water in containers and trace the flow of the river until the Gulf of Mexico. But the water, so their bodies were actually uh, flowing with the river until it reached the Gulf of Mexico. So your body sort of traced the tra trajectory of the river. Um, so her artistic gesture consisted of asking these volunteers to collect river water samples and record their experiences in a logbook. This is what's striking. The canteen and the logbook were then passed on from one group to the next, as we see here. Um, they were. Uh, this part of the, the river um, had dried out, so they had to go to the asphalt. And we see here a ranger sort of uh, writing her experiences um, and her thoughts and reactions to this uh, performance. The Gathering of Waters project uh, establishes a working relationship between people and connect diverse cultures along the entire length of the river, emphasizing that we all live downstream. The sculptures accompanying these projects include backpack repositories, I think there's one here, which contain river vessel canteens, um, video documentaries, etc. And during the process of gathering water, participants were asked to engage with the river and with the wisdom of the Pueblo people, recognizing that this river is a sacred living entity, a source of life and sustenance. By engaging a cross section of social groups, the community had to negotiate competing engagements with the river and learn with and from one another, as a student taught me, a student teacher taught me. The hand-to-hand -hand contact between the members of this newly formed community through the arts right there secured social relations and ecological ties. 
The logbook evidences that it contains scientific data recorded by hydrologists and environmentalists, narrative, uh, narratives of ancestral cosmologies uh, of the Pueblo people uh, in several different languages, uh, samples from the riverbank, accounts of land dispute and abuse that people had suffered um, uh, throughout the generations, uh, entanglement, um, forced displacement, fond childhood memories, and much more. In this remapping of the entanglements of the river, matter, memory, human, other than human entities, Erlen also demonstrates how environmental crisis is inextricable, 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 how do I pronounce that? Inextricable from environmental racism and larger context of structural oppression. What began as an experiment in consciousness, consciousness raising about ecological conditions became a praxis by which early mobilized the very arteries of the planet to unearth the cultural, biological, ecological, and social history of this river. An ecofeminist um, artist, Erlen considers herself both an artist and an activist. She says, my work is in service of the ecosystem. I want to help it thrive. Her project, Reseeding to Recede and Reseeding to Seed Again, um, highlights the need for both scientific knowledge and community action to deal with the implications of climate change. Uh, reseeding, reseeding consists of making books out of huge blocks of ice, such as that one, and the blocks carry a text written in seeds that come from the plants native to the region. These ephemeral ice sculptures gradually melt into the current, so here's someone releasing a book, and releases the seeds of the river onto the river. I mean, the seeds of the book onto the river. The result is that plants grow along the river, and look at this, they help hold soil in place, restore eroded banks, provide shelter for native animals, and sequester carbon dioxide. The artist explains, I think of these books as creating a kind of international ecological language. It is a language of the land, of that particular landscape, of spirit, and of sight. As a lyrical response to climate change, Erlen's books bear witness to our environmental crisis while also providing a small-scale intervention that actively improves that stretch of the riverbank. And the last artwork that I want to share with you today the last one is um, Nancy Holt's sculpture, Sun Tunnels. It has been described in terms of raising awareness about the vibrancy and sacrality of the desert landscape, and th though it's not celebrated as a religious sculpture. It is nonetheless symbolic and has attracted visitors for over 40 years. It was constructed in 1973 in the Great Basin Desert um, of Utah, and is, uh, it has been described as the, as the American Stonehenge. This environmental sculpture is comprised of four concrete pipes, pipes that we see here. They are laid in the cruciform position, and each tunnel points towards one of the cardinal direction, uh, directions. So during summer and winter solstices, the sun shines through, and this is what we see inside. And each of these the holes emulate the shape of uh, several constellations. Um, visitors have described their experience with the sculpture as being awe-inspiring, as being an awe-inspiring pilgrimage, which is interesting, that renews their awareness and connection with the landscape of the Southwest and the cosmos at large. There in the middle of nowhere, one uh, viewer describes, a person is suddenly placed in the middle of everywhere. Here are some more images, and this is... This is during the winter solstice. Taken together, these eco artists urge us to think about matter, materiality, landscape, earth, spirituality, ethics, politics, in ways that do justice to the contemporary contexts of environmental change, global political economy, and post humanist epistemologies. By disrupting the anthropocentric anthropocentric vantage point, these works afford viewers and participators a penetrating vision of the complex system of exchange and interaction that takes place between human and other than human entities. Contemporary art practices combined with environmental activism, political ecology, have converged in an eco-critical and decolonial discourse that unsettles the dominant cultural construction of the notions of nature, the natural world, the environment. 
I want to argue that an environmental aesthetics informed by ecology and religious studies not only increases our aesthetic literacy, but it also develops our bodily, emotional, rational tools of awareness. This awareness or exposure allows us to confront the direction life has taken as a whole, as one of my favorite artists, um, um, Agnes Danes, writes. Uh, environmental artists call forth an ethics of witnessing, of engaging, of collaborating with each other, the earth, its earthlings. Um, they require that we learn to play cat's cradle in com with companion species so that we can become with e each other in a process of symposis. These artists have become crucial agents in facilitating a more ethical and sustainable engagement with the, the earth and their work works not only require us to mobilize our bodies, as we saw, but journey through the landscape and negotiate our identities, and also reflect on the human entanglement with the environment through a praxis that's environmentally sound and that reconfigures um, the limits of our perception and action. They also remind us that another world is possible. But we must be engaged in the practices of sorting out our future. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and how they are acting or becoming with this environment. So it, it's not so much the, the, the impetus of the artist, but it's what happens once you put the artwork out there for people to engage. And somehow they have that connect. They can, those, it, it helps them focus um, their, their gaze into the environment. Yeah, thanks. That's a great answer. Yeah. Question in the back. Um, um, uh, what's that? What do I want to say? <laughs> I, uh, this is an intellectual community. And many of the traditions that we come from talk about a higher level of consciousness that can dawn on the faithful. The Christian tradition comes through the grace of God. Um, it, uh, and as I understand it, art symbolizes things that when it's seen, it enables a fusion in the mind between what's known and some new perception that the art makes available and unifies. Um, I'm wondering what, how a university community can be, which is very, um, seems to me it's kind of uh, one dimensional, I mean, we, the conversation rarely gets beyond a kind of rational, critical discussion. And uh, you don't hear much about aspiration towards a higher, an enlightenment, an awakening, a, that motivates people. And it's beyond the kind of rationality that you'll learn at a PhD program or a master's program at Cal. It's a, it's part of, it's a human capacity. And I'm wondering how the art, I mean, in this community, artful expression might enable people who come here to be educated at the higher levels of education, might enable them to open up or aspire to opening up or to these, to the reality of these higher perceptions or ways of experiencing human life. It seems to me if we could, well, I'd, rather than trying to elevate everybody to the middle class, if we were more perceptive in how rich life actually is, we wouldn't need all the rest of it. You know what I mean? You know, I don't have, I don't have an answer for that, I know obviously. You don't, but I, don't. I find it interesting that that kind of goes to the heart of what I've seen as the difference between my earlier 20th century artists and more recent trends among artists in that in that earlier period those two realms seemed were seen as two separate things and you can't do both yeah. you have to choose which path you're on and um and now I, I look at artists who are saying no i can do both of course i can i'm human i have all of these capacities to me and my art can reflect that what, what that looks like in a scholarly setting, which is so focused typically on the cognitive and doesn't often know what to do with the other parts of human experience. You know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's something in my own scholarship I'm not quite sure what to do with. So I study art, right? <laughs> and make it for myself. But it, it is I mean, potentially, it, unless we can find a way to have a bigger community in which the scholars do that aspect, but they are in community and in communication with the other aspects. Well, that's what the GTU does. Right. And I think it might even be kind of unique in, in, in a way. I don't know, maybe other places are doing it now too, but um, a lot of people of different faiths are brought together, studying, you know, and, and and collect herself did an art exhibition as one of her as, yeah. as one of her exams in lieu of one of her exams. So she was uh, incorporating her own creative process into her scholarship. Just you know that right there. So I, I feel that I think that's a very pertinent question, and I, I feel that educational institutions ought to have the the fora for curating performances or exhibitions because I think the mode of presentation of an aesthetic idea uh, it's, I, I think again 
coming back to narrative theology, which was uh, this is this is today's narrative theology. You, you 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 can learn something and think about it and go to class, but to create the space within the university for for the ability to present things of this kind uh, vitalizes it. You know, it causes that inspiration to happen. To some extent, that happens at CIIS. We have, uh, I, I curate exhibitions over there. Uh, so I'll be curating an exhibition next fall. Uh, so these kind of uh, things allow um, students as well as teachers to be able to turn into this kind of a presentation, which is non-verbal, but uh, ignites, you know, sort of imagination. I think that's it's, I think it's a very important point, and I think universities ought to create that kind of a, however they can, that space. Well, that's some of what we do at the Center for the Arts and Religion yeah. in the Doug Adams Gallery. So we yeah. are definitely covering the arts. Yeah.